Hello and welcome back to Inform Friday. I'm Leila Angelaka uh, and I work for Historic Guevara Scotland in the Technical Research and Standards team. This is a series of discussions about traditional buildings where we are presenting a short topic each time followed by live Q&A. Normally we introduce you to our Inform Guide series as well and other publications that we provide, but this time we will link you to our Managing Change Guidance in the Historic Environment series, which basically advise on planning and consent matters because this is more suitable to this live stream today. So we've had a few discussions and sessions about traditional buildings and appropriate repair methods. We've also spoken about the importance of ventilation and choice of materials in repair, energy performance and the use of renewables. During the last session, we had an introduction to Home Energy Scotland that I hope you all found quite useful. Um, and we also saw the excellent support that they can give. They're all on YouTube, so if you've missed them, you can catch them uh, all there. Today, I'm joined by Stephen Robb from Historic Environment Scotland's Planning, Consents and Advice team. And he will be giving an introduction to a role in the planning system. As always, the event will be recorded and available to watch afterwards uh, at your own leisure. And if we don't manage to answer your question today, we will ask you to email us at technicalresearch at hs.scot. If you want to get in touch directly with Stephen's team, we will ask you to email hminquiries at hs.scot. Don't worry if you didn't catch that, we'll put that on the, on the chat and we'll mention it again. However, please bear in mind that we cannot answer any questions about ongoing or specific cases. So it's time to introduce our guest, Stephen Rob. Hi there. Hello. Hi. Uh, as as Leo's just said, I'm Stephen Rob. I'm a deputy head of historic buildings um, for the planning, consents, and advice team, which we used to call casework, uh, but planning, consents, and advice probably describes it slightly better. Um, I, I deal mainly in my job with listed buildings, so I think the, the, the talk today will probably be skewed towards that uh, um, and really our, our team's interaction with the wider planning system. Um, HES, as, as some of you may know, was founded in 2015 and it was a merger between the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland and Historic Scotland. And I think since then there has been a change in the way that we deal with things uh, in, in our role with listed buildings, including we're, 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 it's easier for us to get involved in things that we're keen to do. And also uh, we are involved at an earlier stage in the process, which has been useful. So firstly, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we that we do that I'm not going to talk about today, if that makes any sense. Um, so HES has a statutory role to uh, to designate listed buildings, to list to listed buildings and also schedule monuments. Um, so I'm not going to talk about a lot about schedule monuments today, but we do quite a lot of uh, different things. Um, and the slides here show um, uh, one of our grant schemes in Trenent in East Lothian, which is just showing uh, what can be done with our investment. I think we put about half a million pounds into that, which we shared with the council. So we do quite a lot of other things, which I won't go into today, but I could maybe talk about later in questions. Um, today, I'm going to concentrate our, on our sort of everyday role in the planning system, um, really as consultees to local authorities. Uh, what we do, what we don't do. Um, I'll look at what where uh, local authorities consult us on um, and how we assess applications and really what we're trying to get across in the advice that we give. Uh, I'll also look at some common casework issues that we have. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll touch on our role in conservation areas and planning. But it's, again, it's mostly going to be listed buildings and hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end or, or throughout. So, um, First thing, the planning system is run by Scotland's 32 local authorities. They decide what needs consent and they also make the decisions. Um, applications can be viewed, every, every local authority has a planning portal, so you can view any application on the planning portal, um, which, is, which is a very useful thing for us. We use this, we use this every day, of course. Um, HES is a consultee. We give our advice uh, and we respond in a short period, normally uh, 10 working days. Um, we write three types of letters. We have a no comments letter, and they're really the majority of letters we send out are no comments, and they're for more minor cases. Um, we have a comments letter, and the comments are really 
focusing on where we can add value as an organization, where we can where we can sort of give our expertise in to to try and better a scheme that's been uh, that's been an application that's come in. And then we have finally objections, which is our which we don't use that often, but it's our really it's our way of saying we don't we don't think this uh, this scheme is it's 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 too harmful to the historic environment. Um, so what happens when we write in we will we will we'll give our advice and ideally uh if we're giving comments it will inform the decision making of the local authority um and our letters normally go on the planning portal for everyone to see now at this early stage um as 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 the slide shows our main work is with uh works to category e and b listed buildings which is about 60 percent of all listed buildings we don't deal with works to category c listed buildings apart from demolition which is um which is the only the only sort of avenue we have to discuss c listed buildings um we also deal with conservation area consent which is the demolition of unlisted buildings in conservation areas quite a lot of conservation areas out there um, and we also deal with planning permission we're consulted specifically on category a listed buildings and their setting uh, and then we also have uh, we also get involved in planning permission in inventory gardens the designed landscapes battlefields setting of schedule monuments but not schedule monuments themselves which is dealt with by us that's schedule monument consent and we also uh, get involved in world heritage sites and royal parks um how do i know what is designated is what the slide says um there we we have our own um designations portal on our website but I, I i often use past map which is is another one of our uh websites which is a, a sort of one-stop shop really to tell you uh what's designated what's listed what conservation areas are there uh what's a scheduled monument you know it, it it contains everything and it's quite user friendly uh you basically you have a big map of scotland you zoom into the area you want you, you tip, tip on listed buildings as you have here and all these dots are listed buildings you press the dot and it tells you that it gives you the list description so it's quite useful it also has um links to canmore which is our national record of the historic environment which will give you more information on the the asset uh, and also some photographs that we hold um and we're currently at the moment working on something we're calling the Heritage Hub, but that's not going to be its final name, which is really going to bring all our information that we have out there in one place. So, so that that it's a huge project, but hopefully uh, that will be up and running in a, a year or so. So um, just moving on, what is a, what is a listed building? Uh, we, have a, we have a separate, uh, our colleagues work in designation. Um, Basically, a listed building is anything made by people uh, from mansions to mileposts. Um, anyone can, uh, we, we designate listed buildings, but anyone can suggest them either to suggest a building for listing or to suggest one for delisting, which we've, we've had quite a few uh, recent delisting requests. Um, to be listed, a building must be of special architectural or historic interest. Uh, so with architectural interest, we'll look at the design, maybe the architect involved, the artistry and decoration of the building, and also its, its current and its historical setting. And for historic interest, we're looking at the age and the rarity uh, and the social historic interest and understanding that we have of the building. So really, as you as you can tell with the couple of pictures here a lot of the older buildings have been listed already um, more uh, we've we've had quite recently we've had quite a lot of applications from the public to list post-war buildings and you'll see uh in the, the the bottom right there the banana flats in leith which uh was listed a few years ago um these these often uh, these are often the ones that that uh, get in the press. A lot of people don't like post-war buildings, or they don't uh, you know they're not appreciated in the same way as the buildings maybe at the top of the slides. But uh, it really is it's really important to list the best of every period. Um, and it wasn't that long ago that that uh, my my pre predecessor colleagues were were a bit sniffy about Scots baronial and uh, Victorian buildings of a certain age. So I think um, listing is very important. But it's not forever, you know, buildings can be lost, uh, they can be delisted. And as I say before, anyone can put in an application to, to have a building listed. 
just going on to the sort of policy and guidance that we use. Um, we have a suite of, uh, of policies and guidance, uh, which starts off really for listed buildings at the 1997 Act. Um, it really that that gives us the uh, the protection of the special interest of a listed building and, and the actual phrase is considering whether to grant listed building consent for any works the planning authority shall have special regard to the desirability of preserving the building or its setting or any features of special architectural historic interest which it possesses now, that's not really saying preserve the building. It's, it's really trying to, to keep the things that have made the building special, have made it a listed building. Um, we're looking at sort of a coverall of, of cultural significance in a lot of our more recent documents to, to cover this special interest stroke character. Um, we have NPF4, which is going through the Scottish government at the moment, which is, is the high level government level planning guidance for Scotland, replaces um, NPF3 and Scottish planning policy. Um, it's kind of, there's, there's, there's been a little change in NPF4. It's, there's more of a, a focus on the climate emergency, net zero, and also on the reuse of existing buildings, which, uh, which we were, we're, we've had quite a lot of input into it. We have HEPS, which is our historic environment policy for Scotland, which is again, is our high level policy. And then we have a series of managing change guidance documents. Um, they cover a variety of different elements of a building roofs windows extension setting uh, that that's sort of day-to-day -day, uh, documents that, that are used in, in council's decision making and also we use them ourselves there's also of course uh, technical guidance which you may have heard from Leela in the past and the local authorities of course have their own guidance on a variety of different things and supplementary planning guidance which helps them make decisions as well um, so what needs listed building consent? Um, well, as, as, as I've just said, um, it's really things that affect the special interest of a building. Um, again, local authorities decide whether something needs listed building consent and then they make the decision. Our comments as before are really to inform the decision and to try and, and, and get the best uh, result for the historic environment. Um, listed building consent can cover the exterior and interior of a building i think it's the big urban myth is that uh, the interior of a building isn't listed or if it's not mentioned on the list description it's not of importance the whole building is listed and and it's really uh, up to the assessor really to work out what what is of special interest so um it's it does require some assessment i think you have to keep asking whether works would affect the special interest and things like maintenance and repair like for like repair wouldn't normally need consent if you've got a a, a new a, a kitchen that you want to replace a modern kitchen with a new kitchen that shouldn't need consent if it's a sort of like for like uh it's really because it doesn't affect the special interest of the building but if you wanted to say go in and remove a staircase or alter the plan form of a building and that's the, the 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 sort of plan you see on the left then these things these things we would affect the list of the the special interest and we would probably comment on them if consulted um so really what are we trying to achieve with list of building consent what, what when when we comment back to a local authority what what's our what, what are we trying to get from from a scheme well i suppose the first thing to say is that listed buildings are important. Um, they're, they're less than 2% of build, Scotland's building stock. They're part of Scotland's landscape, their history. They add to uh, creating a, place, a sense of place um, and our identity and, and even well-being. Um, so really at an extreme, what we're trying to do is prevent listed buildings from being lost, from being demolished. Um, that's the worst possible scenario we can have for a listed building um, and many, of the objections that we make uh, are based on unjustified demolition or, or schemes where we, we, we don't feel that the, the building has been justified to, to be gone. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see uh, some of you may recognize the Printmakers Gallery in Edinburgh. That was a building that was put forward for demolition. Um, we objected. Um, it went it's the, the printmakers gallery decided to move from the center of Edinburgh to this site out at Fountain Bridge. And uh, we, we gave quite a substantial grant to, to see the repair of the building. So that was a very successful case. And it's, it's a good regeneration project in, a, in, a, in an area of town, which has seen quite a lot of demolition over the years. So um, 
we kind of our, our view, and this is coming forward in NPF four, that demolition is is a bad thing. Um, embodied energy of build, buildings uh, is a lot is is lost, or are essentially wasted really uh, with a new build. So so really that's that's something that we're we're looking at a little bit more along with circular economy. If things are lost, maybe uh, we can salvage and reuse materials. Uh, what else are we trying to do? Well, as before, we're trying to retain the special interest, uh, keep the, build, the, the elements of a building that make it special. Um, and that really starts with understanding what the special interest of a building is, understanding what you have. We're trying to avoid harm uh, to buildings or to, to limit it or mitigate it. Um, we're trying to enhance buildings where we can in terms of our response. Um, sometimes conservation restoration work is possible in a scheme. I suppose above all we're 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 embracing change uh, and trying to be pragmatic uh, about things. Um, listed buildings often need to change to remain in, in a beneficial use into the future. Um, we want them to be popular places to for people to live in and people people to work. And in order to do that, we 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 need to see some change. Obviously, we we don't want people to live in the past. Uh, buildings should adapt to modern lifestyles. Uh, and we see a quite a lot of different changes in fashion. For instance, a kitchen isn't, the, you know, in the past, a kitchen wasn't the, the sort of hub of, the, of, of a home in the way that, um, that it used to be. Um, sometimes there will be some conflict. Uh, it's, it's, it's often difficult to get um, an open plan interior in a, in a cellular listed building. Um, Although, I, I, interestingly, in lockdown, we've seen people putting walls back to, to reduce the open plan interior, maybe um, just to give separate rooms again. So again, these are fashions that change. Um, we're also keen to support upgrading for accessibility, for climate change and heat loss issues, which I'll touch on later. And I think above all, we're we're more positive now in our comments. If if there's something that we feel is harmful, we will we will actually suggest alternatives. We will suggest something that will give perhaps the applicant the same uh, end result, but with less harm to the building. Uh, and there's a few other pictures there of of converted buildings, and and there's a, a sort of accessible ramp so so everyone can get into a listed building. So um, these are these are things we deal with on a daily basis. So how do we do our job? Um, well, ideally, applications will come into the planning portal and then we're consulted by the council. But often these applications don't have a great deal of information. A lot of them don't have photographs um, or, or even a, an explanation of, of why they're doing the certain works. Um, so, so we have to really rely on our skills uh, in the team to to read plans for a start, to, to try and find out the information on a building. Uh, obviously, uh, if we don't have photographs of the interior of a building, it's very difficult to work out how, how, whether there is a significant interior that will be affected or um, you know, whether, whether our comments should be stronger or if you know, there's no interior left, then we may not make any comments at all. So obviously site visits are the, uh, the, best, the best way of looking at a building. Through, throughout lockdown, we've really learned to do a lot more online. Um, got a few sort of uh, approaches to finding information out there. Um, the past map and the GIS systems, obviously we can find out the list description. Google Street View is uh, immensely useful. I'm not sure what we did before Google Street View. Um, it, it will show us how a building is relatively recently, but there's also the archive function. So you can see how it looked like five years ago. Um, Estate agents particulars are very useful as well. They often have in uh, every room of the interior is photographed so we can see whether there's a good fireplace, uh, things like that. We, look, we use the National Library of Scotland maps a lot. Um, there are other very obscure things like drainage maps that some council have, which will show when a building was built uh, or altered. Uh, we use Scran, which is a, a sort of visual archive we have, and Canmore, which I've mentioned before. The Dictionary of Scottish Architects is very useful, has a lot of uh, interesting information on architects who have worked in Scotland. And then we use a series of books and archives like the Buildings of Scotland, the RIS Guides, Dina Gilcourt Archives. And really, you know, Google is very important. Again, sorry, I'm not working for Google here, but it, it is actually just to search engine other search engines are available but it is just useful just to find out as much as you can about a building just so you can understand it in order to make comments 
Um, I think there might be some time for questions now if there are, but maybe there aren't. Yeah, we just, uh, just ask if people have any questions just to put them up on a chat. Uh, we haven't had any so far. Um, so maybe give it a few seconds to see if there's anything coming in. Don't be shy, just ask questions. <laughs> If we have nothing yet, um, maybe just continue with the presentation and sure. just leave them for the end. Okay. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, demolition is the last resort for a listed building. Scotland has has a lot of listed. It has it has almost fifty thousand listed buildings. Um, it's quite heavily listed, I think. Um, a lot of buildings were listed a long time ago. A lot have decayed over the years. Um, some have decayed to the state where they're they're no longer no, no longer listable. Um, we we really look at any alternative to demolition, and we have a, a document I'll discuss in the next slide, uh, which is which is is particularly towards problem buildings, buildings at risk. But with demolition, we're really uh, we're really asking a firstly whether the building is still listable. Um, in the first instance, you know, it may have changed over the years. Is it capable? Is it incapable of meaningful repair? A lot of buildings um, have reached such a state where they can't be repaired or the authenticity of the building can't be kept in any repair. So, so we'll look at that. We also look at whether the demolition of a, a listed building is essential to, to giving additional benefits to either financial benefits to, to Scotland or community benefits, and that can be for, for, for new uh, road and rail infrastructure, for instance. And then we also have, uh, which is perhaps the, the, the most used uh, justification, is, is, a, is a sort of economic viability uh, one. Whereas someone who owns a listed building is saying to us that it, it really, uh, the conservation deficit is too high, there's nothing they can do with it. And we do have uh, guidance that will, will will sort of offer the building to to the market to see whether anyone else can come forward with something um so we're offering it at its current market value and this the case that i've shown in these pictures is a rather sad case in uh, kirkcaldy where a building was um in very poor condition it's an old um tram um engine house um it was put onto the market for the price of a pound, believe it or not, um, and no one came forward because of the conservation deficit. We'd even sort of suggested that the, they, they could facade retain, retain the, the facade of this building to keep its 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 streetscape presence. But in in the end, it was demolished because there really what there was no one found who can uh, who could take it on. Um, so, as I said. Anything is preferable to demolition. Uh, we have a document called Use and Adaptation, which is, re is really looking at the um, alternatives to demolition. It's looking, uh, really concentrating on buildings where uh, more, more complicated problem buildings where, um, where their future use is uncertain. So it can be sort of old hospitals and schools and mills. And we have a couple of, of casework examples there. Uh, and churches, of course, uh, come into this as well. Um, we have this, this, this document really suggests a variety of approaches, which starts at minimal intervention, adaptation and extension and goes up to partial demolition and enabling development where perhaps uh, development is built in the grounds of, of a building and the, the, the proceeds of that can help fund the, the listed building. Um, we have a, we have a buildings at risk register that's run by Hess and it's recently come into our team. Um, we have quite a few buildings that are at risk from societal change and that's churches that we have at the right there. We have a lot of churches becoming vacant and more will become vacant. Um, if you look at the Church of Scotland website, you will see a lot for sale at the moment. Um, these are obviously uh, very important buildings to a community, often the best building in a, in a, in a settlement, uh, the most significantly listed. And really finding a new use for these buildings is going to be quite difficult. Um, we've seen many converted to climbing walls, um, housing, uh, galleries. Um, I think there's there's something in Wales at the moment where they're going to be cycling hubs for cyclists to, to pop into. Um, I think ideally, 
a community use is great. There's a church in, in Portobello in Belfield that's been uh, converted uh, using Scottish government um, community right to buy uh, legislation, which is, is serving as a community centre. So that would be, be great. But really, planning has to be, we have to be alive to changes. Uh, we have a lot of issues with town centres. Do we have too many shops now? What can we use? We have, we have to be flexible uh, in, in how we look at listed buildings. For instance, Princess Street in Edinburgh a few years ago, it was all shops. It's not going to all be shops in 10 years. Uh, a lot of new hotel schemes, a lot of restaurants coming in, uh, the Johnny Walker experience. Things change, town centres change. Um, so we have to be alive to, to doing that. Um, I'll just go on to some, some more sort of casework examples that we have. Um, extensions, very uh, often we deal with a lot of extensions to listed buildings. Um, our guidance uh, suggests that extension should try and protect the character of the building, uh, perhaps by being subordinate in, in its scale and form, maybe on a secondary elevation rather than the frontage and of using high quality design and materials. Um, I think the best work uh, must acknowledge this existing building in some way, but there's quite, there's quite a variety. Some, some people prefer a more traditional approach. Um, others prefer a contemporary uh, extension. I think, I think um, based on the quality of the design i think there's all 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 ways of dealing this are 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 valid and this is uh, just a, a, an example we had a few years ago uh, a very uh, classic three bay farmhouse um the applicants came in to extend it with the uh, extension to the top um we felt that wasn't it was you were sort of losing the symmetrical nature of the existing building uh it was quite you know it's quite similar height to it it was in a sort of historical style um although not you know it wouldn't be able to replicate the stonework of the main building it's missing skews and chimneys and has a big wide opening uh, ground floor so after after some discussions the the uh, applicants have come back with a scheme uh, that you see below which is, is is a sort of high quality scheme and actually gives them more accommodation than they 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 wanted in the first place so i think uh, hopefully that was a, a good result for the historic environment um, just going on to interiors, uh, as I said before, interiors are included in the listing. Um, we have a, a, a manage and change guide on interiors, which is really showing how um, the interior can often add to the special interest of a listed building. Certainly a plan form of a building is very important and you'll see a couple of uh, this is from my days working in London, a couple of lo three London townhouse forms based on age. A Georgian townhouse is pretty similar throughout the country. You have, you know, you normally have a door on one side of a, it, takes you to a staircase, a couple of rooms. Uh, the plan form is important. Um, the arrangement of principal rooms, circulation spaces, staircases, these are things we will all look at. We're also going to look at the quality of the interior. Um, Top right, you'll see a buffet recess, which was used in uh, historic dining rooms, uh, where you would put a sideboard. Um, you haven't often find these in Georgian houses. Chimney pieces, fireplaces, important to the, the character of a building. Um, the, the the front of our uh, guidance shows uh, a kitchen going into what will be a principal room in a listed building. Um, as I said earlier. Kitchens have changed. People, people, the, the way people use kitchens have changed. They're often now the focus of a house. Um, so a lot of people have tried are moving kitchens from smaller rooms into larger rooms. And this is this is just showing an example of how you can do that, but keeping the character of the room, keeping the fireplace, having an island unit, these sort of things. Um, there will be conflict as before. Uh, it's difficult to get an open plan um, interior. But there's also, you know, there are things that, that, that people put forward that really aren't necessary. It's not really necessary to remove all the fireplaces in a house. Um, if you don't like the fireplace, it could perhaps be boarded over for future. Um, but we do, we do still do get applications. We had one a while ago, uh, which was removing seven original fireplaces in a 1790s manse. Um, with the justification that they had central heating, so they didn't need the fireplaces, um, which is really missing the fact that they're they're often uh, an architectural feature within a building. It's not necessarily 
a working fireplace. We're not saying you need to have it as a working fireplace, but it is, it's an architectural and decorative detail. Um, and again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, the opportunity for enhancement. Um, this is an extreme example. We're not expecting people to remove dormer windows um, in every case, but this this was a this was as part of a, a large um, conversion scheme in Charlotte Square in Edinburgh, uh, Robert Adam Design Square, and as part of our overall works, um, the the large, I think probably Edwardian nineteen. 20s maybe dormer was removed and replaced with with roof lights which has really returned the the facade to its original uh, design which uh, and I think it was balanced with other works elsewhere in the building so um, I think that's often an opportunity to do uh, to do such works and just if we can move to the next slide um, windows are often uh, they're often dealt with by local authorities, they have their uh, local authorities have their own advice, but we we have our own advice on windows as well. Um, old windows can add to the special interest of a building. Uh, often they're made of high quality timber, um, and just the example on the right there are, is a three hundred year old window that's still in very good condition, um, old enough that it didn't even have sash cords. It was just pegged open, uh, which you don't see many of these nowadays, but a lot of a lot of windows are are, are significant. Um, but we're also very aware that they're also a major component of heat loss in a building. So we're really uh, looking to, to think of ways to upgrade windows. Um, if they're original or historic, the presumption is to try and keep them. Um, Upgrading with draft proofing is often done. Um, secondary glazing is is a good way of, um, of 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 reducing heat loss and also is very good for sound transmission. The the window in the middle is one I've done myself in my own house where I fitted a polycarbonate sheet with magnets, which is cheaper than than secondary glazing. It has made a difference. I I, I did some draft proofing on it as well. Um, Secondary double glazing isn't used that often, but uh, can 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 even lead to to, to better results uh, in terms of heat loss. Um, new technology um, has progressed over the years. We now have very narrow uh, double glazed units or vacuum glass that can go that can be fitted within the a historic frame. Um, that's something that we couldn't really do. We couldn't replicate a uh, historic window often with, with standard double glazing. So technology is changing. Technology for wood has changed as well. You know, you can get sort of wood that is um, uh, is more, uh, will, will last longer. Um, where of course windows are beyond repair or of limited interest, uh, replacements uh, and double glazed replacements are just standard now. I, I think that's a change that I've seen uh, coming in uh, with, I've been at Historic Scotland for 15 years and I was at English Heritage before that. I think the change has come that, you know, it's no longer, um, it's no longer an option to see nothing could be done. Um, and I think uh, double glazed windows are now standard uh, in new windows going back. So um, we do realize, however, that the that there is a great expense in this uh, and also there's a lack of skills to repair windows um, it's often easier just to replace a window uh, and we have been looking into to uh, ways of, of trying to increase skills and also to reduce the, the cost of, of timber windows um, the next slide is really again is going into energy efficiency climate change listed buildings will often need to be upgraded um, to reduce heat loss and fuel poverty, and that's especially uh, in the winter that we're coming into now, and and, and the, the the terrible price of of, of energy. Um, these are these are really uh, important issues. Um, we're we're really supportive of upgrading buildings, um, new ways of heating and power. Uh, this just in the last week, we've had a, a, a heat pump application, uh, solar array uh, in a, a sort of mansion. Uh, down in the borders, um, the, the, these are these are great ways to 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 adapt adapt these buildings so that they'll for beneficial reuse so that they will continue to be popular. Um, we have uh, the 
guide to energy retrofit, which uh, was done by Leela's team. Um, very useful way of showing how to upgrade buildings sensitively. And we also have a climate change adaptation document as well. A lot of listed buildings aren't coping as well with the weather as they used to. Um, buildings getting soaked, water isn't getting off a building quickly enough. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, issues with driving rain. Um, and there's more significant issues. The, the picture you see there uh, is a, a 16th century castle, which was almost lost due to a major flooding event um, up north, uh, which almost got to the undermine the walls of it. But uh, it's, as you see, it's being, um, there's, there's a lot of sort of a new, a new bank has been created for it. But that was, that was a, a garden before the flooding removed it all. So, we're we're aware of these issues and uh, applications to to adapt buildings, um, but again again, it's always important to try and do things properly. Um, and this is really understanding that old buildings are different from new buildings, and you can't treat them the same. Um, traditional buildings with solid walls are meant to breathe. Uh, the components are meant to breathe. Um, putting unbreathable insulation in is is harmful. Um, Sheep's wool and, and wood fiber insulation is now available. Uh, it's been a, it's been it's taken a while, but you know places like B and Q now stock things like this. Um, it's still it's still understanding that 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 the doing things doing harmful or the the wrong approach to an existing building or a traditional building can actually cause further problems in the future. Um, we are where uh, the, the buildings on the right you'll see is a, a solid stone building which has been uh, which has been uh, it's had external and insulation unbreathable insulation added to it uh, which we wouldn't advise um my neighbor uh a downstairs neighbor has has had cement put on our stonework in the past um and uh, the, the last time that someone was around painting the, the stonework with Johnson's water seal, um, which I would never advise. Um, so it's bad things still, still do happen. But you, if you look around you, you'll see a lot of Hessian sacks over walls showing you that they're being upgraded with lime mortar instead of cement now, which, was, which can erode sandstone very quickly. So, so good things are happening. Um, in the middle is one of the guides that we have online, which uh, again have come from Leela's team. Um, these will show you how buildings have been upgraded. Uh, they'll go into the detail of uh, what has been done and, and the, the savings in heat loss that have been made. So these are, these are very useful. Um, I don't know if there's any questions yet, um, but yeah. I... I yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna pause here. I mean, there's okay. there's, um, there's still some things that Stephen will be talking to you about, uh, such as conservation areas, etc. But I think we start having quite a few questions, so we'll just get on them. So the the first one is about grants uh, and whether there are any ongoing grant programs available for renovating listed buildings. Now we will put up a link in the chat, which basically links to our grants uh, advice, our, our web page on grants. Um, but just very quickly to to just say, of course, the um, the upkeep of your building if it's listed is up to yourself. There are some grants available from ourselves and other bodies, which you will see on that web page. Uh, but generally speaking, of course, um, these are not available for like uh, standard repair and maintenance. Uh, they're mostly community projects or um, for larger sort of mansion houses that are very difficult to to take up. But Stephen can actually add uh, anything he wants to. Yeah, we, we have we have quite a generous grant scheme, um, which is which is based towards buildings and areas grants. We, we've just done a, a, a revamp of our grants recently, which which our team was involved with. Um, so there are there are grants uh, which you can read on our grants webpage on HES and also on the buildings at risk register, which we which we've sort of upgraded to try and sort of bring together all sort of sources of finance that you can maybe get to historic buildings. As Leila says, a lot of it is based towards sort of community uh, projects, but there are there are grants available to um, 
to private individuals as well. There's a, there's a series, as well as the grants we give out, there's a series of city heritage trusts around Scotland that, that operate their own grant systems in, in, in the cities, as you'd expect, uh, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen. Um, so, so there are a series, uh, so it's really worth going to either our grants page on the website or to the uh, Buildings at Risk Register, which, which has uh, sort of sources of, of grant aid. Also, to, to add to that, that if you are in the Edinburgh World Heritage Site uh, boundary, I am aware that there will be some offered, especially with regards to energy efficiency and adaptation. Of course, there will be some um, sort of <laughs> limitations to that and uh, the, um, the renovations or um, the proposed works will have to kind of follow the same line that we advise to follow with regards to vapor permeability and um, ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, second question is from uh, John on Facebook. What would be your advice for window repairs or a method of upgrading the thermal efficiency and sound reduction for such windows and how much historic value is there to keep traditional crown or plate glass? You can maybe ask the, the uh, sorry, answer the last question about the, the plate glass. Well, I think I think our advice is, is really saying if you have historic glass, uh, it's worth it's worth retaining. Um, but I, I, I suppose that's really that's really looking towards the more uh, the rarer types of glass, like early cylinder and crown glass. Um, I think plate plate glass is is is, is sometimes. Uh, more significant but it, it's for a c-listed building that would be that would be the council so you would probably the council all, all councils have their own um advice on window replacement um so that it, which which might differ it differs actually differs between councils some some building some councils will have advice on windows uh which will differ appear according to how visible the window is um I mean, I, I, as before, you know, if, if they're historic windows and they're in good condition, we would always suggest that that, that retaining them is is worthwhile. Um, I, I think um, there are several ways of upgrading them. I, I, I personally, I, I think secondary glazing is 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 very good, but I, I know that some people um, don't don't particularly like it. I think there's been lots of poor secondary glazing done in the past, but I, I think it is a good way of. Uh, reducing certainly sound transmission as well as heat loss. But um, yeah, I, I, I think repairs repairs is often an issue because to get someone to repair a window can be quite costly. And um, and it also requires a certain amount of skills, uh, which sometimes depending on areas don't exist. But our, our advice would normally be to try and keep historic windows of interest or, or original windows if possible. Uh, to add to this uh, answer, to say that crown glass or plate glass, well, cl crown specifically is really rare to find uh, actual yeah. crown glass. So if you do have that in your building, um, you would be encouraged to keep it. Again, it depends from local authority to local authority, depending on on the um, the percentage of original glass you have in your window. So let's say you have um, five uh, panes that are crown glass and and the rest are sort of modern. Again, check with the local authority. With regards to upgrading the thermal efficiency, we we do have um, a previous live that we've done on specifically Windows that you, um, you can watch online. Uh, it should be listed sort of underneath here. Uh, and we talked extensively about the hierarchy of solutions from draft proofing to sort of simple secondary glazing like the polycarbonate sheet that Stephen mentioned to basically um, replacing. So I would encourage you to to watch that live. I would just also say things things have moved on greatly. Uh, I've, I've been working uh, for quite a while in different areas uh, of, of conservation. I think in my early days, uh, my colleagues and myself would be recommending horticultural glass to go back in windows, which was very thin and cheap. It was basically used for greenhouses because it had that sort of um, poor quality really so it's, it's sort of showed you a, a bit of a shimmer which kind of um replicated old glass these 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 days have passed uh you know i think if 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 glass is being replaced uh there are alternatives whether it's narrow 
double glazing or, or vacuum glass is now becoming more popular in Scotland because it's made uh, in Europe. It used to come over from Japan, I think, and, and now it's uh, there's quite there are quite a few firms who are putting it forward as a as the savior. You can keep your existing windows, and these vacuum glass panels can go in really in a similar way without much alteration to the window if you if you if you don't have as, as Leah said historic crown glass which is which is quite rare to be to be fair and a lot of windows uh, have been replaced over the years as well so I mean I, if you don't have a historic or original window uh, if it's been something that's been replaced in the 20th century or something it will be of less interest obviously Great, thank you. Uh, next question is actually related to that. Um, whether we are keen to see reinstatement of astragals if they have been previously cut out, and maybe we need to explain what astragals are. Yes, astra astragals. I, 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 I talked a lot about astragals when I went down to English Heritage, and no one knew what I was talking about uh, because an astragal uh, is is a moulding detail down south, but it is basically a, a, a Scottish word for a glazing bar. Um, this this used to be a huge debate. Uh, and I remember uh, I used to work in Westminster, and I, and I think there was a huge discussion in Bath about whether astragals should go back. I think I've always taken the view that yes, um, if if your building um, is uh, has not been altered in a you know it's not been revamped perhaps in a Victorian time, and you know if you have a, an original Georgian building. And you're keen to put the the six over six windows, for instance, back. I think we would we'd normally, and I think most councils would normally support that. Um, I suppose unless you've had uh, a building that has been um, revamped, re remodelled significantly in Victorian periods, where maybe the the one over one or two over two windows are more significant to 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 what has happened to the building. But if you say you just have a, a straight Georgian building um, and you want to put the astragals back, I think that would normally be uh, agreed and certainly we see a lot of uh, plate glass windows which were put in yeah I mean obviously window technology changed if you lived in an area uh, the fashionable thing to do was to get plate glass um, to get rid of your astragals but I think um, a lot of people are putting them back and then putting in double glazed units or narrow glazed glazing at the same time so I, I think we're, we're normally quite supportive if, if, if it helps the significance of the building can be seen as a conservation gain Thank you. Great. Um, next question is by Rowan on Facebook. What is your policy on the installation of solar panels on listed buildings? Right. Well, we have a we have a managing change uh, on micro renewables, which mentions solar panels. Um, we're we're generally there isn't we were generally keen to see solar panels. Um, We've seen we we try to sort of avoid them on the front elevation or visible elevations of a building. Um, we've seen quite a lot of applications of solar panels going in, in in land for sort of larger buildings. We've seen quite a few solar arrays coming. Um, I think this this is this is one of these moving issues. I think with solar panels, uh, we had an, we had an application uh, very recently uh, which was putting it on both slopes of the roof, and we were we were sort of looking to see where where the the best uh, the best position for solar panels are uh, often if that's on the frontage of a roof um, that can sometimes affect its character but it's not something we we we're often these these are issues that we would leave to the council to decide most of the time because um, it, it's there, there's more than just historic buildings uh, advice at, at, at at heart in this really but I think often we find places where they can go. Um, Commonwealth Pool in Edinburgh uh, has got solar panels on the roof. Uh, Edinburgh Castle, you may have heard the uh, the war memorial, the amazing Lorimer War Memorial has solar panels on the roof now. Uh, we've had solar panels on Crichton Castle for many years. It, a lot of it is to do with visibility and, and how they affect the, 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 the character of the building as you view it. But I, I think we're, we're obviously open to 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 works to to uh, improve, um, and there was we did have a, a a spike in solar panel applications quite a few years ago when there was a a sort of fairly decent grant system out there, but that's the and that kind of stopped afterwards. So we're kind of hopeful that things like that might happen in the future. Great. Um, next similar question from Colin on Facebook: What's your policy on heat pumps? 
Uh, again, this is this is this is a moving feast. We had a, we we haven't had a lot of applications. It used to be um, we would have heat pumps in in sort of rural areas, uh, and the biggest states would be using them. Um, it's only recently uh, that they've started um, coming into sort of just more domestic listed buildings, I suppose. Um, I what I'm hopeful is that councils will put together design guidance, you know, which will suggest where heat pumps go, because this is going to be something that everyone is going to have to, to look at in the future. Um, you know, gas boilers aren't going to be a thing uh, in the future. So I, I'm hopeful that this is the sort of thing that councils will bring in policy, which will say, uh, this is, you know, this is our view on it. This is where they should go. Uh, you should club together uh, if you're in a tenement, things like that. So I, again, we had one last week, no problem at all whatsoever with one going in. Um, it's it's sort of, uh, it, was, it was on the back of a listed building. Um, it's not going to be an issue in lots of cases, unless you're putting it right on the frontage of a building, uh, obscuring a, a historic part of it. But I think mostly there is an opportunity to, to, put, to put them in sensitively. Great. Um, next question is from Aidan on Facebook. If a building is B-listed, is it only the elements that are noted on the listing that are to be looked at, or is the building as a whole, interior and exterior? Uh, it's the latter. Um, the list description, as my colleagues in designation only say, is really just to identify the building. Um, our more recent, I, I, we have a lot of listings from the, the 70s and 80s um, where a, a whole terrace of buildings will be described in a couple of letters, uh, in a couple of sentences really. Um, whereas when we're listing buildings now, if you'll note some of our recent listings are beginning to, to go into a little bit more detail about what the interior has and what the, the significant parts of the building are. But um, really it's the whole building and i think it's that that's really uh going back to how you understand the significance of a building you you can you can assess what's important with it so the whole building is listed um but sometimes the interior may not be of great interest um sometimes you know some of the the the, late, the elevations will be less polite if you like or less designed than others so it really it's really a case of assessing every building on a case-by-case -case basis um, but yes it's the, the list description is really to identify the building and, and you can't expect to, to cover everything um, in, in, in that. Great um, another question from Janet on Facebook what's the best way to manage a fireplace they're so small and the chimney doesn't draw we have them boarded off but what's best to stop drafts and damp okay I <laughs> well I, I, I'll say in my own house I've put in chimney balloons which is which have uh, which have uh, helped but um, this might be more for Leela, <laughs> to be honest um, yeah from from a technical standpoint and i'm not gonna talk much about significance or removing them because we're talking about generally traditional buildings let's say um you are best to keep them for various reasons uh they do help with draw out the the stale air so they help with ventilation um however if you're not using it using them of course they're just basically there and and might just give drafts in so there are ways to minimize the drafts such as with uh, the chimney balloons or boarding them off uh, in a lot of our properties and our own uh, cases or buildings that we've worked on we've actually put um if we're not using the fireplace or or having it open we've either put a, a damper on it basically you can just close it on and off uh, according to the weather and the drafts or you can actually put a hit and miss grill similarly you can close it if the went if the weather is really you know it's cold and, and and windy outside but have it open in the summer or where you feel that you're cooking or you're doing something that creates a lot of moist air um we generally don't advise to to block them and just forget about them they 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 might still be open the the chimney flue might still be open so you have to think about the um any maintenance that's that needs to happen in the actual flu any moisture or water coming in from the outside so our advice is to keep to keep them maintained and if you're not using them just temporarily close them off with any of these um measures that we've talked about we do have another informed fire that we've spoken a bit more about fireplaces and um, again i would advise to kind of go back to that to listen a bit more about it um 
I might have to pause with the questions and maybe let Stephen for, um, continue the presentation. Maybe maybe we, we summarize it a little bit and then go back to the questions because I know we're getting a lot of them. But you still have some things that you need to um, you would like to mention about uh, planning applications, etc. Yes, it was just it was just to continue. Um, we also deal with conservation areas. Um, conservation areas cover quite a lot of uh, sort of historic cores of Scotland's towns and villages. They they're desig they're designated by local authorities by councils. Um, uh, with the intention to protect areas of special architectural or historic interest, the character or appearance of, a, of which it is desirable to preserve or enhance. So uh, obviously um, they're not treated in the same way as listed buildings. Um, they are, uh, councils are supposed to uh, produce character appraisals uh, or management plans. And you see the, the one you see here is in Logie and Dundee, which is one of the early 1919 Act uh, estates and, and the character appraisals on the right. Um, some permitted development rights are removed uh, in conservation areas. Um, so you, you, you know, replacing windows and doors and roof, uh, uh, roofs can be, uh, well, might need planning permission. Whereas outside a conservation area, they would be permitted development. So you could just go ahead and do them. Um, we have, as I said before, we have quite a good grant scheme uh, which comes forward um, and uh, you know we, we run that in conjunction with local authorities uh, we've, we've we've put in a lot of money to to town centers uh, in order to try and uh, repair buildings get buildings back into use and I think uh, we're quite sort of pragmatic in the way that we'll put money towards upgrading the fabric of buildings and and, and trying really to to, to keep buildings keep buildings going so but in terms of in terms of our role in the team we're we're only consulted on the demolition of unlisted buildings and conservation areas uh, and that's the, the next slide so um with with demolition of buildings in a conservation area the idea is to try and retain buildings that make a positive contribution to the area so you really have to assess the building work out you know whether it whether it makes a, a contribution to the the character uh, of of, a, of an area, um, so we would try to to make. You, the, the, the idea is to, to have a positive a, approach made to try and reuse a building before demolition is considered. Uh, and this is this is a, a church uh, we have at the moment, which is um, being put forward for demolition. It's not listed. Um, it's quite a simple. Um, primitive Methodist church, um, but we felt it made a contribution to the conservation area and there wasn't really any justification for its loss. So um, that's an ongoing case, so I'm not going to identify it. Um, but sometimes, you know, a lot of buildings within conservation areas are demolished. Not, not all buildings make a positive contribution. Some uh, may have little townscape value. They're not visible within the area. Uh, some may have deteriorated and their structural condition will just mean it's too expensive to to reuse them and others are just very difficult to reuse so quite quite a lot of demolition happens um, within conservation areas the idea uh, really is not to allow the demolition of a building until permission has been granted for a replacement development just this is just really to avoid the gap sites that you see in some uh, in some towns uh, and I think finally is, is planning permission, which I'll go through very quickly. Um, we're, we're also consulted on planning permission that normally runs um, in a similar way to listed building consent. They're, they're both applications go in at the same time. Mainly in our team, it's to do with um, alterations, uh, extensions to listed building and also to their setting. Uh, so this is, this is where the setting issue comes in for listed buildings. Uh, we're only uh, consulted on A-listed buildings, but we're also consulted on planning permission in, as I said earlier, design landscapes, world heritage sites um, and battlefields. So um, really uh, the setting guidance is, is something that we use quite a lot. Um, all buildings have a setting, all assets have a setting, uh, but this can vary greatly in significance. Um, what's the setting of a cairn? What's the setting of a castle? Does a ducat have a setting? Clearly, uh, a milepost is gonna have less setting than a mansion, um, especially uh, a mansion that's been designed to take in views of a landscape or even with the landscape designed around it to, to, to take, take in views from principal rooms within the building. So. We, when we look when we look at the setting of an A-listed building, we'll look at the 
really um, what the asset is and how it will be affected, uh, how it's how its setting contributes to its its uh, the, uh, the understanding and appreciation of the asset, and then evaluating how any development will impact on it. And the building on the left there was a was a, a, a large mansion which had a view of uh, a river view open over countryside. And I think the, the the idea was to build a housing estate in front of it. So it was a case of trying to retain a sort of corridor of view, uh, if you like, uh, to, to retain the setting of that building. Um, and I think that's it really. Um, just, just showing you one of our major pieces of casework, which was the Royal High School in Edinburgh, um, which has just been approved for a music school. But this was the uh, early hotel proposal, which we objected to both on, on the grounds of its listed building, but also on the setting, because we felt that the setting of the, the building in the middle was being uh, quite significantly harmed by the huge hotel extensions either side. Um, so hopefully that, that that's an objection uh, and now it has been taken over by a music school and that has been approved this week, revisions to that. So hopefully something will be happening because the idea uh, is that we don't want to see buildings blighted for the future. So it, it's really um, good to see uh, another scheme has come forward for it. And I'm happy to take any questions if there's time. Great, right, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I think um, I know we're running a bit out of time, but I think it's worth going through the, the questions we've received because they're quite good. Um, that was really useful. Thank you again. We have a question from Alistair on Facebook. What is the minimal scale of development that you would be open to pre-application engagement on? The person who's asking, they deal with a lot of listed buildings and conservation areas, so they would like to have some formal HES guidance to attach to the applications. Right, that's that's a very good question. Um, we are we are open to pre-application engagement. Um, since since lockdown, we have dealt with a huge increase in pre-app work, and now I think a lot of that has come because the councils are hugely busy and overworked, and they they can't maybe do pre-app in the same way as they used to, or uh, a lot of councils are now charging for pre-app, and we're still a free service. I think we will be forever. Um, I think uh, we're trying to we're trying to answer as much as we can in terms of, of pre-app, but we 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 do think it's it's sort of um, we prefer if it's if it's buildings that we're going to be involved with. As I say, we don't comment on the majority of applications that are consulted on. So I think if we're if we're we're, we're responding to, I think it would be ideally if it's built if it's something that we would likely be involved with in the future. And it's really, but we do see pre-app as really important. You know, we have a lot of cases where um, the pre-app. Uh, involvement means when the application comes and it just sails through and there's no issues. So uh, we're keen to, but we do have we do have limited numbers uh, to look at as well. So we're trying to concentrate on on perhaps cases that we will be involved with when an application comes in. Great. Uh, next question from Colin of Facebook. They have a red sandstone building where the inverted roof has a central gully which passes through the loft. Is there planning allowance to allow these to be capped as they create a significant heat loss and have leakage problems? Um, yes, um, the drainage of historic buildings is, uh, is, is probably another lecture. Um, I, when I was in London, I dealt with uh, Georgian houses that had gutters that went through the attic, internal open gutters that went to the back elevation. And of course, if they flooded, you were it was right into the the building, and lots of problems were caused. Uh, I mean, I think it's a common sense thing. If you've got it, if you've got an, an issue which is causing a problem, then there's there's often a way to uh, design that out or to make it easier. Um, do you mean? Do you mean? I, I'm just I'm, I'm just wondering. Do, do you mean actually removing the inverted roof or just the gully? Um, I think I'm they mean sure. just capping it. They they mentioned capping it, so I think just yeah. Well, as long, as long as there's some way for the water to get out, I think that's that's the issue. We do we do have quite complicated drainage in Scotland, um, some of which we still have uh, drains that could you know that, that that go down the centre of Walling in some buildings, which uh, again are very difficult to get at. So, I think we do occasionally get applications to change um, to get to to allow water to get off a building easier, and I think that goes very much with with the sort of climate change adaptation, you know with water gates on roofs and things to try and 
shed water from a building as quickly as possible rather than it having lying around. So I think, you know, we'd obviously be happy to look at anything uh, that, that, that will improve these situations. Uh, just also to add that, of course, the, these inverted roofs are quite important. They, you know, they're, they're an important feature of the roofscape in um, in a lot of places, especially, you know, in Edinburgh. So yeah. always check with your council. I'm not aware of any planning allowances specifically for something like that, but just check with your local authority, have a pre-app discussion with them. That would be the best way, I would say. Yeah. Uh, next question, which is similar to the one we had uh, from Joe. It's about the feature, sorry, um, people ask, is this feature part of the listing? However, they are, uh, they, they are asking whether it's the whole building, where it's all listed and consent is required regardless. Uh, there, is, there isn't really a difference between uh, categories of listing. Um, it, and, it, and it is the whole building. So you, you might have a category C listed building that will have a very uh, interesting interior and you might have an A-listed building that is literally a shell. So it really is a really a case by case to kind of assess what you have. Um, you know, there's a lot of buildings that have uh, amazing interiors um, and they'll be very significant and and, and, and and there might be some issues with, with changing them or, or changing them radically. And there'll be other interiors that are very plain or have been altered in the past that, uh, that, 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 that there isn't, um, the same sort of significance so i it really is every case by case but there isn't there isn't a difference really in terms of listed buildings in terms of the grades the the, the categories grades english I, I i came back here i was calling it grade because it's grade one grade two star and grade two in which uh, is a b and c is categories up in scotland but um i i had that sort of uh, beaten out of me when i started back here great i think we have one last question to take on uh, it's from Lorraine on Facebook. Sorry, no, that's a different one. I think the the one from Lorraine will ask will answer it in the comments. Um, but uh, sorry, it's from Sarah on YouTube. Do you have an up to date guide on improving fire safety in listed buildings? Scottish government website links to conversion of traditional buildings document from two thousand seven. I can answer that actually. Um, <laughs> our plan for the next three years is to actually update. This guide, it's a it's a massive job to do, so it's not something that we can do very easily. We've been also a bit un understaffed in our team, uh, but it is in the plans to upgrade this. For the time being, you have, besides this document, there's another one um, which is addressing fire safety, which is specifically, it's not about conversion necessarily, it's about fire safety management. Uh, I don't remember which guide for practitioners it is. It could be it could be six, but I'm not sure. Um, we'll link it in, in the chat um, once we finish the live, so you can just uh, have have a read through. It's also two two volumes. There's a lot of information there, but we are looking into updating this. Uh, we also we also have a managing change uh, on fire coming out very soon, which we're, we're, I think in the next couple of weeks it will be going to consultation. So uh, look out for that as well. That's, exactly that's of, of major fires yeah okay that's great um if there's any questions that, that come in um after we finish the live we'll we'll try to answer them or direct them to the appropriate people but um for the time being i i would like to thank Stephen very much that was really useful and i hope everyone found it quite informative thank you to everyone who joined in for this event uh, this is the last session for this year to hear about any future events, please sign up to our newsletter and check the Engine Shed website. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everyone else. Thanks. And enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.